You're looking at the ballots cast by Athens County voters today. It was a similar scene at the Board of Election offices around the country. We'll have the results of some of the big races in this region next on this special edition of Newswatch. Polls are closed for this midterm election. It's time to take a look into tonight's early unofficial results. Good evening, I'm Nathan Takich. And I'm Blaine Carraher. Tonight we'll have an in-depth look at what some of these races mean to voters. It's a pretty amazing night for me. I mean, this journey from McKee's Rocks with a mailman father and a whose father was a coal miner and a and a mom whose mother couldn't speak English. It's amazing. That was Governor John Kasich speaking after unofficial results came in tonight. He's leading the race and we'll have those results for you on WOEB.org. Supporters of Issue 7 say that the Athens Bill of Rights will secure the basic fundamental rights to a healthy environment. WOUB's Alex George is with the supporters of the bill. I'm live at the Cider House with members of the Bill of Rights Committee who have worked hard for Issue 7 and say that it is crucial in the fight for a healthy environment. This is a dangerous activity, threatens our water, therefore we should have the right to say whether or not we want to permit this activity in our community. Issue 7 is a proposed Athens Community Bill of Rights and Water Supply Protection Ordinance. Bill of Rights Committee Chairman Dick McGinn says that the citizens of Athens should have the right to protect their air, water and quality of life against the negative impacts of hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking. Mike Chattisee of Ohio Oil and Gas Association says, on the other hand, by passing Issue 7, voters are turning down a chance for economic development and that fracking is not an environmental problem in our area. Chattisee also points out that if Issue 7 is passed, the city could be subject to costly lawsuits. It's going to be in conflict with state law. Ohio Revised Code Section 1509 clearly states that all oil and gas activities regulated by the sole and exclusive authority of the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. So you could potentially set up an issue where the city of Athens and the state are in conflict with each other. If issue 7 was passed and then challenged in a local court or common police court or something of that nature, that because of state law being so clear that issue 7 would be overturned. Ultimately, it will be up to the voters to decide what they want for their city. As of right now, all precincts have reported, and the unofficial results are that 2,245 are saying yes to Issue 7, with only 623 saying no. The Bill of Rights Committee is excited that Athens is saying no to fracking in the city. Reporting live at the Cider House in Athens, I'm Alex George. Thanks, Alex. We'll update those numbers again for you later on in the show. Republicans are projected to win the majority in the national congressional races, but the local race for the Ohio State House might be a different case. WOUB's Tori Knieven reports. Democratic incumbent Debbie Phillips campaigns for her last term in the Ohio House. We'll continue that fight. We'll keep fighting for the region and fighting for our kids. Phillips has been in the State House since 2008. Before that, she was a member of Athens City Council. Challenger Yolan Dennis is a registered nurse from Washington County, making her first run for public office. I can bring a group of people together to uh, strategize and uh, form ideas. Dennis says she will bring groups together, but she and Phillips have many opposing viewpoints on issues like abortion, fracking, even Common Core. I believe that it takes away the power and decision making of our local educators, our teachers, and our parents. We have not been doing what we need to do for students, and setting the bar high is a reasonable thing to do. Even with the focus on campaigning to get to the State House, no matter the outcome, both say they will continue to serve the community. I'm still going to be uh, a strong voice for the people in my community and any, any um, surrounding um, uh, areas. I'm going to keep doing the job that people have hired me to do. Um, if they decide they want to pick someone else, then I'll, I'll figure out what's next. Reporting for WOUB News, I'm Tori Kneven.
The four counties that this race covers are currently reporting into our newsroom. As of right now, Debbie Phillips and Yolan Dennis are tied at, in the unofficial results with 50% each. The vo votes will have to go through an official count before a candidate is decided and announced. The candidates are fighting to represent Meigs County and parts of Athens, Washington, and Vinton counties in the State House. The Athens County Auditor serves as the Chief Fiscal Officer for the county and manages over $50 million in funding. Athens City Auditor Kathy Hecht attempted to unseat the incumbent Jill Thompson, but that bid appears to be in vain. With 100% of the precincts reporting, Thompson has won with 58.4% of the votes. Kathy Hecht was left with 41.5% of the ballots again. The provisional ballots have not been figured in, but this win makes for the Republicans' fourth term as an Athens County Auditor. Moving into the statewide auditor race, Republican incumbent Dave Yost is challenged by Democrat John Patrick Carney and Libertarian Bob Bridges. During his current term, Yost worked on monitoring schools that were cited for scrubbing attendance records. If elected, Carney wants to use his authority to audit Jobs Ohio, an agency currently shielded by law. Results are not finalized for this race, but the current numbers show that Yost is leading with 58% of the votes, while Carney only holds 38%. WOUB's Alex George was busy this week. She also took a look into the race for the Athens County Common Police seat. It's been a heated one for Athens, Alex. Incumbent Republican George McCarthy and challenger Herman Carson have been going head-to-head -head for the Athens Common Pleas judgeship. The two candidates have very different backgrounds, one serving for many years as a public defender and the other who has spent time working on the prosecutor's side. Carson is currently the director of the Athens branch of the Ohio Public Defender's Office. If elected, he hopes to improve the efficiency of the court and has vowed to keep a current docket, claiming that his opponent has doubled the overdue docket since taking over the position. I'm a caring individual. I look at people as individuals in every circumstance uh, to understand what brings them uh, into court. McCarthy says Carson's comments are misleading and that his docket was inherited from his predecessor, Judge Michael Ward. McCarthy was appointed by Governor John Kasich as Common Pleas Judge in May 2013. Well, I've been prosecuting murder and drug case, serious drug cases, or been defending uh, uh, murder and drug cases for this time. If re-elected, McCarthy would like to continue his work on establishing the first veterans court in the Common Pleas branch. Reporting for WOUB, I'm Alex George. Here's an update for the unofficial results of the Athens Common Pleas judicial race. George McCarthy is leading with 56.5% of the votes, while Herman Carson only holds 43.5%. All eyes are on the polls this evening as voters lined up and cast their ballots for statewide races. But not everyone voted today. Some voted weeks ago. We'll look further into the complications with early voting for this election season. PBS talked with Charlie Rose about his program, The Week. It's about the experience we've had this week, uh, looking at interviews we have done and say, what does it mean? and in a precise, finite way, answered that question. What's significant and what makes me better understand the world I live in? Hi, I'm Charlie Rose, watch The Week. Check your local listings. The student body here at Ohio University absolutely is a family. The students support one another. You become this unit, this big, friendly family unit. There's this connectedness. You feel a part of something. Driving in on the highway and just seeing the red bricks and the trees again, it's just like coming back home. There's great students, great professors. You just walk around campus and think, oh my gosh, I can't believe I go here. I feel like I matter in the community and I feel like I matter here at Ohio University. It's home. Athens is home. Hi, I'm Mark Wahlberg. Antiques Roadshow is soaking up the sun and searching for Florida's treasures on the million dollar sandbar, Miami Beach. They were a dumpster dive. At 99 cents, I couldn't lose. Oh my goodness. Really? Really? Really. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Next time from Miami Beach on Antiques Roadshow.
The act of casting ballots before Election Day is known as early voting, and it's been highly debated for years. WOUB's Angela Rygard took a deep look at early voting and tells us why it's controversial. Mary Smith, that lives in Athens, Ohio, should vote by the same rules as Mary Smith, who lives in Ashtabula, Ohio, or Zanesville, Ohio, or Cleveland, Ohio. This year, the early voting debate reached a whole new level. In February, Ohio passed a law that got rid of the six days before the election, where Ohioans could both register and cast their ballots at the same time, something referred to as Golden Week. In the same month, Republican Secretary of State John Husted issued a directive that set the in-person absentee voting hours. Ohio is, has one of the most expansive early voting schedules in the country. It's very easy to vote here, but we also try to make it hard to cheat so that we can maintain the integrity of the elections process. But not everyone sees it that way. Early voting advocates were angry that Houston's order eliminated evening hours and all but one weekend for in-person voting, and that the law had cut early voting from 35 days to 28. The American Civil Liberties Union filed a lawsuit asking a federal court to strike down the state law and directive. We live in a world where you can do 24-hour banking, that you can go to the grocery anytime, and really our voting should be just as, if not more, convenient in order to encourage more people to participate. The dispute was thrown around in court. In September, a federal appeals court sided with the ACLU, extending early voting opportunities. But then, just 16 hours before early voting was to start, the U.S. Supreme Court put a hold on the ruling, once again eliminating Golden Week. Peg Rosenfield is an election specialist for the League of Women Voters. She says the state has always struggled with this issue. In 2005, there was an initiative on the ballot that there were several things, one of which would have been to not require any reason for voting absentee. They didn't realize that once you take that away, then the campaigns will figure out, oh, we can get our people to vote early and lock up those votes. This year, it's a governor's race, but we are only two years away from the presidential election. In a swing state like Ohio, this debate is bound to continue. It's not anywhere near over. Reporting from the State House for WOUB News, I'm Angela Rygard. There may be a small step towards compromise on this issue. Both Republicans and Democrats have discussed the possibility of online voter registration, saying it would make things easier for the modern day voter. The Ohio treasurer race was one of the closest statewide races during this midterm election. Republican incumbent Josh Mandel faced Demo Democrat challenger Connie Pillich. Current reported results show that Mandel is leading with 58% of the votes, while Pillich only holds 42%. Mandel spent his campaign talking about the success he has had during his past four years in office. Pillich ran on the bipartisan line. There's no Democrat or Republican way to get things done, just the right way. Republican incumbent Mike DeWine is claiming victory over Democrat David Pepper for the Ohio Attorney General position. DeWine campaigned on his push for faster DNA testing in the criminal investigation and identification lab. It's an issue he ran on four years ago. Democrat challenger Pepper campaigned on a plan to battle the current Ohio heroin crisis. DeWine is claiming victory with 62 percent of the votes to Pepper's 38 percent. For complete election results from your county, you can check out the ticker at the bottom of the screen and visit our website at woub.org. There you can find up-to-the-minute reports and even more information on the stories you've seen tonight. For the first time since 2002, voters in Mason County were asked to decide the fate of Sunday hunting on private lands. WOUB's Caitlin Roman reports. Steve Whittington and his son Hunter are spending a rainy Saturday morning doing what they love hunting. It's a lifestyle for West Virginia. I can't believe it's not a West Virginia law. He's talking about being able to hunt on Sundays. If Sunday hunting on private land passes, hunters in Mason County could spend their entire weekend in the woods. Most of us are working folk. You know, we work Monday through Friday. So Saturday's the only day that we have to hunt. Um, I talked to a gentleman the other day. He said, I wanted to take my grandson squirrel hunting. Uh, it rained on Saturday. I didn't want to take my six-year-old grandson out in the rain on Saturday, and I couldn't hunt on Sunday, and I had to go back to work Monday. However, not everyone in Mason County believes hunting should be allowed on Sunday. 
Some believe it is a day of rest for both people and animals. Others say church attendance will go down. R.F. Steen of Mason County, who has been involved in the Sunday hunting movement, says back in 2001, the state legislature made Sunday hunting legal throughout West Virginia. But it was left up to voters in each county to decide to ban it, which Mason County residents did in 2002. West Virginia is one of the few states in the nation that have restriction hunting on Sundays. 45 out of 50 states allow it. Currently, 19 of the 55 counties in West Virginia allow Sunday hunting. Hunting may be a lifestyle, but as one supporter points out, Sunday hunting is a freedom of choice. If Sunday hunting is implemented and you're not in favor of it, the good news is, is nobody's forcing you to hunt on Sunday. Reporting for WOUB News, I'm Caitlin Roman. Roan County is the only other county in West Virginia to have this on the ballot. Currently, the hunting on Sunday's issue is passing with 57.5% of the votes. Making history is in a politician's job description. Pardon me, description. Usually they do so with policies and new programs. But this year, Shelley Moore Capito won the West Virginia Senate race and made history for a different reason. WOEB reporter Bianca Hillier is live in the election center. Bianca, how did we get to this outcome and what does it mean? Blaine, we got to this outcome earlier than usual. The Associated Press reported at 7.30 this evening that Democratic candidate Natalie Tennant conceded and Republican candidate Shelley Moore Capito won the West Virginia Senate race, making her the first female senator to represent the state. I spoke to Donna Boley earlier, who is the only female currently serving in West Virginia State Senate, and she explained why this is a huge step for West Virginia. Oh, I think it's a... Uh... A big deal. I would just say that we need more women in office. I just think they will represent West Virginia. They'll bring a different perspective, probably, than men. Bully also spoke directly to why Capito will lead effectively. She does bring 14 years as a congresswoman. And I don't know that she just represents women. She represents both men and women. I just think you'll see uh, West Virginians, both men and women, represented better at the federal level than you have been. Before tonight, there were only 20 women in the 100-member U.S. Senate, so Capito is single-handedly increasing the amount of women in the Senate by 5%. So again, for those of you who are just tuning in, West Virginia Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate Natalie Tennant has conceded earlier this evening. And Republican Shelley Moore Capito is the first female to be elected to the U.S. Senate from West Virginia. Blaine. Thanks, Bianca. Fairless Local School District has not passed the levy in over 20 years. This year, they're asking for 8.9 mils over the next seven years. Results are coming in for that race after the break. Head like a crocodile. Massive jaws. A spectacular sail. This is an animal that we know was enormous and very strange. One of the great mysteries of the dinosaur world. Can a new discovery resurrect Earth's largest predator? We're going to be figuring out things as we look at the bones that we never dreamed possible in a dinosaur before. Bigger than T-Rex, a Nova National Geographic special. So how did we get to today's refrigerated world? It took people like the college dropout who tried to ship blocks of ice cut from a frozen lake in Boston to steamy Georgia. Everywhere he goes, the ice melts. And a guy trying to feed his family in the Arctic. Discovering how to make things cold has changed our world in many unexpected ways. This is one of nature's more mysterious creatures. Just ask Anna Salceda. Ten years ago, she adopted an orphan sloth named Velcro. For two years, we were inseparable. Velcro changed my life. Now, sloths are in danger. Driven by her memories of Velcro, Anna is off to meet the people trying to help these animals before it's too late.
Good evening, I'm meteorologist Paige Wampler. Today was a beautiful day to get outside and vote, but tonight it's gonna rain. We're gonna have late night showers occurring right around midnight and lasting into tomorrow morning. The low tonight will be a warm 46 degrees, and we'll have winds out of the southwest at five to 10 miles per hour, becoming calm around midnight. If we take a look on into tomorrow, the high will be 60 degrees, right on target with the normal temperature for this time of year. We're gonna be seeing uh, chances of some rain in the morning, tapering off by afternoon, mostly cloudy skies for the afternoon, and then we're gonna be seeing chances of rain build back up later in the evening for tomorrow. And now if you take a look at that seven day forecast, we're gonna have chances of rain lasting until Friday with a low down to 29 Friday night. Uh, mostly cloudy skies on Saturday for the weekend, 49 the high there and 33 the low Saturday night. Sunday we're gonna be seeing another chance of rain into the forecast with a low of 32 degrees that night. And Monday, the start of the work week, we're gonna see partly cloudy skies and a high of 49. And Tuesday, another chance of rain showers come back into the forecast. Tuscarawas County put three local school district tax levies on their ballots. WOUB's Taylor Petrus is live in the newsroom with more on the results for one of the school's districts. Thanks, Nathan. Fairless Local School District was one of the schools on the ballot. It's located in Stark County, actually just north of Tuscarawas County. Fairless was hoping to pass an additional levy of 8.9 mil, which would generate over a million and a half dollars annually for a seven year period. Now, what's interesting about Fairless, it has not seen any new money for nearly 20 years. And unfortunately, it looks like they will have to wait a little bit longer as unofficial results from Tuscarawas County show that it did not pass and it's still being decided on in Stark County. I spoke to Superintendent Brock Bidlack and he said it was very important that this levy was passed in order to educate future generations of students. The health and wealth and, and longevity of a, of a community is one, how well is your school district doing and showing that community support. And in turn, we're going to do our best to offer the best education possible and to make good decisions with their financial commitment. Now, since 2008, Fairless has cut 40 staff positions, 22 of which were teachers, and they have cut nearly $4 million annually from their budget. Reporting live from the newsroom, Taylor Petrus, WOUB News. Thanks, Taylor. The other two districts on the ballot were New Philadelphia City Schools, which is hoping to pass a 6.9 mil levy, and Newcomers Town School District with a 5.9 mil levy. Both of these levies would expand over a five-year period, and both of these are renewal levies for the school districts. As students filter out into the hallways of Miller High School at the end of the school day, water filters from the roof into the hallway ceilings. And southern local schools are turning to voters for help. A public school is, is, is ran and funded by the residents of that community, so it's important that we continue to, to upgrade our school facilities. The southern local school district is looking to pass a five-year 4.5 mil levy which will raise just over $200,000 each year for school improvements. There are, there are a number of things that need upgraded, especially our roof. Uh, our high school and our commons area roof uh, have a, a number of leaking issues, so, that, so it's very important to, to, for that levy to help us with that. Along with a new roof, the levy will go toward updating HVAC units, resurfacing blacktop, purchasing three new buses, and replacing flooring, the stadium bleachers, and press box. Holbert says the levy would also create an improved learning environment. If we are providing them with a safe, uh, warm, comfortable facility where they can concentrate on learning and not external things, uh, I think that no doubt will contribute to learning happening at the max. A learning environment free of distractions, so the only thing that can filter in is knowledge. Reporting for WOUB News, I'm Allison Gens. Thanks, Allison. The Southern Local School District results are all in, and it failed with 63% of the votes. Today, for the first time in two decades, Chillicothe residents voted on whether or not to increase the city income tax. However, the percentage amount is tripled. WOUB reporter Katie Anderson talked to city officials who said there's a lot at stake if the levy does not pass. We're trying to replace two grants that we lost. Uh, we lost those two grants because they migrated to the big cities with the crime that they have. At stake. As many as a dozen city employees of the police and fire departments could lose their job and two fire stations would likely close. The police and the fire department uh, shrink in the overall effectiveness of the uh, number of boots on the ground it takes to get the job done is diminished. 
A portion of the levy will also go to repairs and maintenance of roadways. We take a step back. We don't get any roads improved. We don't have money for that in our current budget. All you have to do is drive down any of them and you will find that uh, they're all in need of repair to one degree or another. Chillicothe resident Connie Meyer has gone back and forth about how she'll vote on the levy, but by today she would made up her mind. If the residents want the services, then you're going to have to pay for them. According to Mayor Everson, it's been more than 20 years since Chillicothe has increased income taxes. Everson hopes residents realize how big of an impact this levy has on Chillicothe's future. When it's gone, that's when people will wake up and say, hey, we, we really lost something special here. For WOUB News, I'm Katie Anderson. Thanks, Katie. Current results that we have in the newsroom for the Chillicothe tax increase show that it has failed with 53.4% votes against and only 46.5% for the increase. All precincts for this race are reporting. Libraries all over the state have been losing money. WOUB's Ann Jacob talked with the Athens Public Library about what their operating levy will mean. Statewide funding for Ohio libraries has been decreasing since their largest cut of over $75,000 in 2009. Now, for the first time since their founding in 1935, the Athens Public Library is requesting an operating levy. The one mill operating levy would last for five years. This means someone with a property valued at $40,000 will pay $14 a year. Lauren Miller, the director of Athens County Public Library, says she's already made lots of cuts including buying used furniture and cutting staff, but sees more cuts in the library's future. If it does not pass, we will see a decrease in purchasing power for our print and non-print materials. Um, also, that includes e-content, our digital books, our digital magazines, music, and movies. The library would also have to cut hours, meaning people facing the digital divide would have less access to computers. Not everyone has a computer or can afford a computer and the internet connectivity and paying that monthly bill. And number two, there are still pockets in Athens County that don't have um, accessibility to high speed internet. Last year, more than 65,000 patrons used computers and more than 500,000 items were checked out. Although there's no apparent opposition to the levy, library workers believe the final decision will be a close one. For WOUB News, I'm Ann Jacob. Thanks, Ann. The current results show that the Athens County Library levy has passed with 64.7% of the votes. Along with the Athens County, Scioto County has a library levy on their ballot as well. The Ohio governor's race between Republican incumbent John Kasich, Democrat Ed Fitzgerald, and Green Party candidate Anita Rios is over. Angela Rygard joins us from Columbus, where she is stationed with the Republican Watch Party. Angela? I'm live here at the Renaissance Hotel in downtown Columbus, where the Republican Party is celebrating their fifth winning streak in the past six years in statewide elections. Now, it's no surprise Governor John Kasich won his bid for governor against a Democratic opponent, Ed Fitzgerald. Now, unofficial results are showing the governor ahead 64% to 32. Now, this could be one of the most historic wins in modern day history following George Voinovich's win in 1994. There's some questions to consider moving forward now that the ballots are counted. For one, what is the state of the Democratic Party? Will Chris Redfern be replaced as party chairman? And for the Republicans, how do they keep up this winning streak with all of their statewide office holders not up for re-election? What new faces will emerge in these next few years? Live from the Renaissance Hotel, reporting for WOUB, I'm Angela Rygard. Thanks, Angela. With the Republican National Convention taking place in Cleveland in 2016, this win appears to put Kasich in a powerful position. And now we are getting word from our newsroom that the Republicans have clinched the U.S. Senate, but we'll be getting you more information on that on our website at woub.org. But that does it for our uh, tonight's election coverage on Newswatch. Thanks for watching. I'm Blaine Carraher. And I'm Nathan Takage. Be sure to check in with WOUB Radio and woub.org for any updates for any of the close races. And, of course, tune in to Newswatch at 530 tomorrow night.